All right. Let's do this. Let's, uh, let's set ourselves to hear God's word. One of the things that we need to do is silence our phones and our hearts and open our hearts to God's word. Amen? I, I cannot stress the seriousness of this enough. And I will explain a little bit as we go along in the message. But folks, the times are interesting. So take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> and uh, you get there, and we're going to go to the throne of grace. The Bible is an incredible book. You know, when we open it, the author is there. And not just there watching, but there ready to help us understand. That's why I am so glad I can take this book, I can hand it to somebody and Maybe you'll give them a strong concordance and say, look, two things. Number one, you've got to remember, and this is important. The Bible interprets itself. Again, a little bit more on that later on. But then also, the author is there. God gave his word to be understood. We need to listen. And this is one of those times. So by God's grace, may we hear the message. There's a lot we're going to be covering. I pray that we can assimilate it the best we can. Heavenly Father, your will be done now. Lord, open our hearts. Help us, however necessary, to take down truth, to remember truth, to understand thy word is truth. I pray in Christ's name, amen. In Ephesians 6, let's go ahead and go back to where we began, verse 10, and let's read up to where we're going to be today. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. We've already stressed this. You need every bit of the armor. There's not one of us in here that, that, is, that, that is capable of withstanding the wicked one and in this world being a testimony and just laying some of this aside. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And may I add this? I've seen the devil at work. Even this last week. In fact, I've been a part of it as far as the, the receiving end. Others in this building have the same way. We need what we're going to see. For again, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. So therefore, verse 13, wherefore take unto you again the whole armor of God, why? That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So now, we're going to start looking at the specifics of our armor. I ask by God's grace that you listen carefully. Look at the first phrase in verse 14. Stand, therefore having your loins girt about 
with truth. Now, one more time, two things I want to stress. The wicked one, don't forget this. The wicked one is known first and foremost as a liar. Jesus himself said he's the father of lies. That's how he gets his work done. Why does he do it? Number one, he hates God. He shows himself and is an angel of light, but at the core of his being, he despises the God of heaven, which brings us to this. He despises those that were made in the image of God. In other words, Satan has nothing but hate for you. When he seeks to draw you, (coughs) he's not drawing you to something that will benefit you. He will lure you into something and then once you fall, he will turn around and he will condemn you for what you did. He does that at the throne. Jesus told us. His passion is your destruction. If he cannot destroy you, He will go as far as he can to defeat you in every aspect of your life. Are we listening? He is not all powerful. Praise God, he's a defeated foe. But, but, he is the father of lies. And that's how he gets in. You need the belt of truth. First of all, definition. We got to fly through this. This is important though. It's the translation, what we see in our Bibles in the Greek is a translation of the Greek words aletheia and alethus. How this brought about, how this was brought about, it's a compound word made up of lathano which means to escape notice, to be unknown, unseen, unhidden, concealed. But what the Greeks would do, they would put the letter, the alpha letter at the beginning of the word and it twists it completely. It makes it the exact opposite of what that word meant. So therefore, what this means is unconcealed, unhidden. It's there for scrutiny, for investigation. When it comes to religion, when it comes to Christianity, it means what is true in things appertaining to God and also to the duties of man. So it's unhidden in God's word. He is telling us truth. This is what we need to hear. We can understand it. There's also another interesting word, Alethanos. It's also translated by the word true, but it has an added content of meaning. It is used 22 times in John's gospel, only five times in the other books. It means this, that which has not only the name and the semblance but the real nature corresponding to the name. I remember when uh, I was a kid and we, my, our, our family, we would go up to uh, Downeyville and we'd go gold panning. I loved it. It was great. And one day I thought, man, I have hit the mother load. Boy, this, look at this. This is great. There was an older fellow there that was camping by us. And he said, come here, young man. I want to show you something. We ran out a corner of a river and there was all kinds of that stuff that I had just found. It wasn't gold. What this means is when it says gold, the gold is gold, pure, period. For instance, in John 3.33, God is the elethist God and that he cannot lie. John 3.33, 
He that hath received his testimony has set his seal that God is true. But in John 17, 3, he is the alethanos, God. Watch, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. Now notice, John, in the book of John, seeks to get his readers to understand this. The God that we serve, the God that sent his son, he is the true God and there is no other. He is the genuine God, the only God. That's why there are places in this world that despise Christianity because that God is superior. He's the only God. He's saying there are no other gods, including the 300 million that they worship. The Lord Jesus is the alith on us. Watch. John 1, 9, John said this about Christ. That was the true light, speaking of Christ, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, in John 5, verse 35, John, speaking about John the Baptist, said this, he was a burning and shining light, which he was. But Christ is the true light. He's the one that lights us for heaven. Our Lord is the alethanos bread, John 6, 32. Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. That's Christ. Now, according to Psalm 105, Moses gave them bread, but Jesus is the true bread. Why? Because he's the one that satisfies all the way across, not only body, but body, soul, and spirit. He's the one that we feed on when it comes to our spiritual being. God's word is truth. Christ said in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It is what the Bible says about himself. So bottom line, God, his word, and his son are truth. No falsehood at all. The book that you have in your lap is the Bible. It is God's word. Yeah, but what about, no, no, no. You got to understand something. The same God that guided when it came to the writing has guided to what we have. Understand that. Now, there's an illustration of this, and that's what we're looking at. We're talking about the belt of truth. The Roman's soldier's belt held in place the armor that protected the lower part of the soldier's body. The standard garment, picture this, the standard garment for a Roman soldier was a loose-fitting tunic. You know, a square piece of cloth, you've got a hole for the head, the hole for the arms, and it drapes over the body. Now, a couple of things. When they're fighting, you don't want this thing flopping all over the place. When you're working, same thing. There would be people as they're dressed like that. They would want something. So they would take this belt and they would gird themselves about. In fact, the phrase gird about literally means fasten one's belt. When a worker had to move fast, he would gird his loins. He would tighten things up. When the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, he gave instruction concerning the Passover and he told them this, quote from Exodus 12, eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and she shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. In other words, they were to be dressed, ready to go. That's what that means. That's what it implies. The Lord Jesus told his people 
be ready to go. Luke 20, excuse me, Luke 12, 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Our spiritual loins, which is what this is talking about, our spiritual loins are to be girded, ready to go. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know when our Lord is coming, but we need to be prepared whenever that is. We need to be prepared whatever it is that we must go through. We need to have our loins girded, our lights burning. In other words, this book shining on your heart, letting you know, telling you, this is the way walking in it, because thy word is truth. Be ready, be ready. <clears throat> Excuse me. In fact, Peter said in 1 Peter 1, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Again, that's what we've been talking about. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, having said that, there's the illustration. I'd like to give you an observation as I've meditated on this. Can I ask a question? What's happened to truth? Now, I'm not trying to get political, although I can say this. It's stunning how truth has taken a hike in so many areas, be it academia, government, uh, media, truth has disappeared. It's now a time to get an agenda going. But that's not our main focus. I'm talking specifically, folks, about spiritual truth. Is it important? You know, the story goes like this. Satan and uh, one of his demons, they were taking a walk. They're down here on the earth, so they're just walking about and they're walking along and they're watching mankind and they look over to the side and there's a man, he's walking along by himself and he sees something shiny on the ground and he picks it up. And the demon says to Satan, what was it that he just picked up? And Satan says, oh, he just picked up a piece of truth. Piece of truth? Well, Satan, what are you gonna do about that? Unconcerned, he says, well, I'll just have him make a religion out of it. Now you stop and think about that. See, if we're not rightly dividing the word of truth, you can pick something out of the scripture. And if you ignore other scripture, you can do what a lot of people have done today. You can build a religion. It just, it disturbs me. And, and, and it's reached into us how there are movements that have come along, oh, we've missed something. I, what, what, we're not a cult, and I'm not gonna go into it right now, but it's just, it, it, it's so sad because Satan, again, is a liar. Folks, that's why I am so glad, look, take it I, I, with my blessing. But you make sure this, you compare scripture with scripture. You just use a simple Strong's Concordance to find out what did that particular word mean? And God will show you. But there are slick mouthed, Godless people, they're saying, hey, let, let, let me, we, we got a new truth. And so you've got the Mormons, you've got Catholicism, and you've got another, other isms that next thing you know, people are being, being carried off by every wind of doctrine. Be careful. Some people think the truth is relative. And this is what they say. Well, you, you know, your truth is different than my truth. 
I don't think so. I don't think so. Hey, my Lord, Jesus Christ, is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13. When it comes to his word, Psalm 119, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Go to 2 Peter 1, would you please? 2 Peter 1. Look at verse 19. We have also a, read it with me, more sure word of prophecy. Now listen. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Hello? It's not that. Well, this is what the Bible means to me. No, what does the Bible mean? For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Listen, one of these days, maybe what you need to do is this. You need to sit back and you just need to look at your Bible go to any portion and realize that the God of heaven moved for that to be written so that we can know it and we can understand it in light of other passages that were written. Listen, concerning the moral law, what God said was sinful when Moses penned it, it's still sinful today. We are concerned that we show the love of Christ to sinner, sinners. I understand that. Th there's a debate that's raging right now. A well-known man, not necessarily in our circles, but a well-known man said this about, hey, you know, somebody wrote him, you know, I've got a relative. I forget how the relative is related to the individual, but uh, th they're, having, they're, they're having a marriage that God does not recognize. And he said this, well, listen, to show them the love of Christ, um, go ahead and go. And in fact, maybe buy them a gift just to let them know, folks, you read God's word and you let the Bible interpret itself. You read the life of Christ. And again, remember they're saying, we wanna show the love of Christ. You will learn this. Jesus ate with sinners. He spoke with sinners, but he never congratulated them concerning their sin. He never did or blessed them in their sin. We've gotta remember that. Does that mean that we hate? No, no. But we are not going to bless wickedness. Now that, again, sodomy, murder, immorality, idolatry, they're still wrong today. What happens? Listen, when somebody trusts Christ, there is a change. Paul told the church at Corinth, and such were some of you but you're washed, you're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. In other words, you ain't what you was. You've been changed. You're a new creature in Christ. Then when it comes to truth, some people say, well, it, you know, it's, truth is optional. Now, wait a minute. Let's go back to the illustration that the Lord gave us. The belt kept other pieces of the armor secure and in place. It helped to distribute the weight of the breastplate from the shoulders of the soldier. This was a great help because that plate, it, it, it would weigh from 22 to 33 pounds. 
without the belt, stuff started falling out of the way. It just, it, it wasn't held exactly where it needed to be. It would dangle loosely. The belt was not optional. But there was also something else. And please get this. There was also something else about the belt. You could take the helmet off of the soldier. Are you listening? You could take the breastplate off. You could lay aside his armor, but if he had the belt on, that identified him as a Roman soldier. It was specific to a soldier. Folks, that belt of truth, that sets us apart. We're not believing the lies of the wicked one. Thy word is truth. You can take the tie off. You can put on the blue jeans and sneakers and all that. You can put them in a military uniform here. You do any of that. But what comes out of the mouth and is lived through the life shows the belt of truth. Amen? Amen. This is what we need to think about. 2 Corinthians 4.11, for we which live are always delivered unto Jesus for Jesus' sake, excuse me, unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal body. There it is. I have walked in truth, Psalm 26. 1 Corinthians 13, rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. 1 John 3, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. 2 John 4, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. What I used to sign young people's Bibles to when I was a youth pastor, 3 John 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Now I'll go to the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi. For those of you that don't know where that is, get into your New Testament, turn left. When you cross over to the Old Testament, you're right there. Because see, there are other people, and listen, there are some people that believe truth is burdensome. It's a burden. There were people in Israel felt the same way. Look at verse seven, verse seven. Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and, and ye say, when have we polluted thee? And that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. I'm not going to bring my best here. <laughs> I'm saving that for a meal. You know, this stuff has gone wrong. We'll bring this instead. Look at verse 13. Ye said also, behold, what a weariness is it. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of truth. I, I, I'm, I'm tired of the Bible telling me to be a witness. I'm tired of the Bible telling me to stay away from sin. You know, if you want to have a little bit of fun in this world, you got to be able to sin just a little bit, can't you? I'm sorry, but my Bible still says the wages of sin is death. Are we listening? If the Bible says, thou shalt not do thus and so, and you say, well, you know, it's not going to hurt all that much. Guess what you just did? You just took off the belt and it's going to fall apart. Now, I, I, I'm telling you this in love. Folks, God's people are getting ready to go into major challenge. What the rest of the world at times has had to put up with when it comes to a lack of freedom and wind up going head to head with the wicked one in other places, it's happening here. I'm telling you, I can sense it. I've seen it. We have said this. As 
the, the hand of God's blessing moves away from America, guess who is filling the vacuum? It's amazing to me that we have people wanting to set up statues to Satan in state capitals and other people are coming to their defense. We got a problem. When you have kindergarten teachers bragging how they are teaching kindergartners woke philosophy, we got a problem. We can't bring a Bible in, but we can bring in Marxist philosophy. We can bring in evolution and teach them, not in the beginning God, but in the beginning dirt. My Bible is still this, truth. Other people might be leaving away the belt of truth. By God's grace, we don't want to do the same. Look again at verse 13. Ye said also, behold, what a weariness it is. And ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And ye brought that which was torn and the lame and the sick. Thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? Oh, I'll come to church as long as the Super Bowl isn't on. Yeah. That's called a tackle. I played football too. That's no punt. I mean, we, we, need, to, we need to recognize something here. What is true? I'm t I, I have told you this before. I'm going to tell it to you again. The church that I went to in Southern California, made up of men who were in technology at that time when it came to the moonshot. I will never forget the Sunday night Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin had landed on the moon. They were going to be walking sooner than expected. And I looked around the auditorium. We were there for the evening service and I saw these same men who were involved in the moonshot. They're sitting there Sunday night. They're there to worship. But I mean, this is incredible what's going on. Not to them. To them as thus saith the Lord. I'll never forget those guys. I praise God for the testimony that they were. If we set this aside, if we wind up looking at obedience as being something that is burdensome, optional, whatever, in other words, let's put it this way. No wonder the church is in the condition it's in today in America. That's not what we want in these four walls. Thy word is truth. Let's stick with truth. You know, in Matthew 15, the Lord said, this people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Wow. That, that's a perception of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. How many people have done, you know, just that? The name, the name of Christ. You don't know how close I came. I was reading something just yesterday, and I'm going to be encouraged. I, I'm going to be including this in a message down the road. But this man was emphasizing the fact that in reality, it's amazing how many people in our churches are truly not born again. Because if you cornered them and said, listen, what are you trusting? They go, look, preacher, I've been going to this church longer than you have. You know, I, I, I mean, my dad was a preacher. I, listen, I had a man in the capital of Sacramento. He looked at me and said, listen, he was a state senator from Southern California. Hey, listen, you know, my uncle was a preacher. My brother's a preacher. I grew up in a family of preachers, et cetera, et cetera. He never once gave me a clear representation, a, a, a clear 
testimony, I should say, of trusting Christ because he was a sinner. No wonder he was known for having left his wife because he had an adulterous situation with some other woman that was also in the Senate in the Capitol, and they were both Republicans. It's not burdensome. That sin that was taking you straight to hell and paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ that sin is still not your friend and not my friend. We need the belt of truth. We need to be girded with truth. Let's understand this. The Bible tells us plainly, Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That means we get into this book. We get into this book. No wonder the Lord used David to teach us to pray this. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We need a working truth, excuse me, we need a working knowledge of the truth in scripture. I've already mentioned it before. But Paul told us in Ephesians 4 that we henceforth be no more children tossed about to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You don't go to a church, quote unquote, it's like, well, this is the, this, this will be fine for me. There's a need that I need to be here. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If they are if they are taking the word of God and twisting it to fit an agenda, and there's plenty out there, there's a problem. Bottom line, folks, the Bible is truth. It is reliable, it is accurate, it needs to be read, and it needs to be believed. That's why we stress 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. You will learn something. Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. What's the deal? Hey, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, truly furnished unto all good works. Why do we need it? Because of what Paul told Timothy. Now the spirit speaketh expressly here was the focus that in the latter times, I think that's us, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to, guess what? Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You see, if it, you know, Satan doesn't come along and you know, he's got a bazooka, and the gun belts, and you know, he's got the, you know, all the ammo and go, oh, I'm just gonna blow you away like you can't believe. No, he comes with a smile on his face. He's got a Bible in his hand. And he says, Hey, I want to show you something. Now, by the way, the Bible isn't the only thing he has. Are you listening? Amen. It's not the only thing he has. Sometimes it's doctrines and covenants. Sometimes it's the Book of Mormon. Sometimes it's the writing of Ellen G. White or Mary Baker Utter Gladyson Pettery or whatever she was. Sometimes it's going back to the doctrines of the Judaizers. It's amazing. Satan will be subtle and slick, anything to enslave us. The only true freedom is in Jesus Christ. That's the only. The Bible is our truth. When we came to Christ, it was because it was revealed to us in Romans 3 of our sin and the solution of Jesus Christ, the fact that he's the way to heaven and the final destiny of the saints is, praise God, not purgatory, but heaven, absent from the body, 
present with the Lord. And only the Lord knows when that takes place. But praise God, he knows. But there's one other thing, and I'm gonna be quick about this. Not only does that word truth refer to the content of that which is true, but the attitude of truthfulness itself. Paul, again, said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. That's why we are to be girt about with truth. You see, there was a, uh, there was a pastor that I was hearing preach. This, this was really interesting. It was during the uh, Iran-Iraq war. And uh, no, not Iran-Iraq wars. It was, you know, desert storm and all that. He, he was sitting next to, he was sitting next to a soldier that was coming back, flying back, coming home. And uh, this soldier said, you know, uh, yeah, I've been gone. I think it was like 13 months, something like that. And, uh, you know, just, just can't wait to get home. And, and the preacher said, wow, I bet you've been thinking about that every day. He said, oh, no, sir. No, we're trained not to do that. No, we, when we're there, our focus is on the battle. We're, we're not focused on heaven, or excuse me, on, on home. Now, we are to be looking unto Jesus. We're waiting for him to come. But right now, it's 2024, and America is in a big mess, and we need to go to the prayer closet. We need to pray. I, I love it. Tim Schmidt has this burden now. We've got to start up the prayer meeting. We had a prayer meeting for over two years leading up to the tent meeting that we had several years ago. So now, every month, we had a two-hour prayer meeting here this last Thursday. It was wonderful. There was five of us. Look, we need to utilize that prayer closet. We need to get to the throne of grace. We need to understand that God has given us that throne so that we can come to him in love. We've been looking at that on Wednesday night. Hey, listen, do what you can to be a corporate part of a local fellowship coming in, praying, begging God, not begging, rejoicing in what he does, but asking him, coming to him, asking like he tells us in Philippians 4, bringing that which we desire, seeking his will. Do it. Ah, you know, I'd, I'd rather watch something else. That's the problem. We've gotten wrapped up in some things. And by the way, pastors can do that too. I know. I are one. And boy, oh boy. We're told in Romans 12, and I'm almost done. Again, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How does that happen? The word of God. To be girt about with truth means to, that we embrace the truth as it is revealed in the word of God, that it means we live out that truth in our lives day by day. In other words, we're real. Not sinless. I mean, it's not that we go out to practice sin. We blow it sometimes. Oh boy. But we leave it. Lord, Forgive me, Pew! I'm moving on. Christians are fighting for something far greater than a perishable crown, far greater. We are to stand for him in the day of battle because it's his will for our lives. And that's what he blesses. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate, and all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And when we are in heaven and he hands us our crowns, 
if we're getting any, we'll see the nail prints. That in itself ought to get us to realize if I'm going to live out this life, I need to do it with, as it were, the belt of truth that identifies me. I'm a child of the king. 